Good morning, or depending when you're watching this, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. My name is Ross, and as always told, out of voice of radio. So today, I'm here with a video that took me a very, very long time to make. A very long time to make. But given that the lovely folks at Tabletop Gaming had their awesome Tabletop Gaming Live planned, and the world being rubbish as it is at the moment foiled those plans, and as they are putting on a replacement online, Tabletop Not So Live, I'm not sure if that's the actual name they went for, but if it's not, they totally should have done. I figured, you know what? They wanted me to make a couple of videos for it, and this seemed like an appropriate one to make, so thanks to those lovely dudes. Now, this is the most dominant Pokemon decks we've ever seen. In the history of the Pokemon trading card game, the most dominant decks ever. And I know some of you probably aren't going to be happy with this list. The way I see it, there are three. There are three Pokemon decks in the history of the game that were redonk. We're going to go over some near misses to begin with as well, but... I, I'm not looking for good decks. I'm not looking for very good decks. I'm not looking for world's winning decks. I am looking for pretty much every tournament you have to either play this or a direct counter if you can find one. And it won worlds or would have if there was a world. And there was never any doubt that that was going to happen. We're looking for ridiculous over the top borderline unstoppable decks we're not looking for. Oh, that deck was quite good. So for instance, the Feraligator. From Neo Genesis. Very, very good card. Had the Pokemon Power Downpour that let you as often as you like discard a water energy from your hand. And then Riptide for free energy did 10 damage. Plus 10 more for each water energy in your discard pile. And then you shuffle them all back into your deck. It was a very, very cool deck. It was initially used with cards like Trash Exchange. That let you essentially count the number of cards in your discard pile. Shuffle them into your deck. But then discard that many cards from the top of your deck. Hopefully you would then be just discarding a whole bunch more water energy. And round and round you went. But I don't think that ever really fit the bill of being dominant enough for me to want to put it on the list. Similarly, there was a great, great deck that was known as Absol Eevees. Now, the main attacker in this deck was Absol EX, had an ability to let you move three damage counters from one Pokemon to another, and an attack that did 30 damage and 10 to each of your opponent's bench Pokemon that already had damage on. But the key to Absol Eevees was it was an Eevee Lucian's deck, i.e. a deck made of Pokemon that evolved from Eevee. And they all had these really great coming into play abilities, or poker powers as they were called back then. So Flareon EX, when you played it from your hand to evolve an Eevee, you burned and confused the defending Pokemon. Jolteon, when you played it from your hand to evolve one of your Pokemon, your Eevee in this case, you put one damage counter on each of your opponent's Pokemon. Clearly great for Absol that further damaged the already damaged Pokemon. Vaporeon forced your opponent to shuffle their hand into their deck and draw four cards, which was obviously rather disruptive. Espeon. Let you devolve one of your opponent's Pokemon, take the highest evolution stage off. The theory being, of course, you've done enough damage through spreading that the pre-evolution will be KO'd when the highest stage evolution gets removed. And then, of course, we had Umbreon that let you just drag a Pokemon from your opponent's bench into the active. This was a great, great deck that had a great run at many, many tournaments. But it never really won Worlds. Now, when I say never really won Worlds, it did kind of win Worlds in 2007, but not really. You see, the list that won Worlds in 2007 was a Flygon Absol Eevee's list. And it had the Flygon EX that put one damage counter on each of your opponent's benched basic Pokemon between turns. And it had the other Flygon that he's a Delta species, which means they're the wrong type that let you attach a basic energy or a delta rainbow energy from your hand to one of your delta Pokemon. So basically, yes, Absol Levy's kind of one world, but not without Flygon. So I don't think I can in good conscience put Absol Levy's on this list. Verizon Genesect, very, very good deck. This was, well, I mean, it, it literally did revolve around Verizon and Genesect. And it was a phenomenal deck, let's be clear. At the 2014 World Championships, three of the top four decks in the Masters division 
Wurverizian Genesect decks. It absolutely dominated the World Championships. But it didn't really dominate the metagame, the format, going into Worlds. Yes, it crushed Worlds. But going into Worlds, I did not get the sense that this was going to be the case. We all knew it was one of the top decks, don't get me wrong. Nobody's arguing Verizon Genesect wasn't an amazing top tier deck. I am arguing it's not one of the most dominant decks we've ever seen. Now, Verizon had the ability Verdant Wind, which stopped all special conditions, which was nice. And this was your starter Pokemon. You, for two energy, did 50 damage, and you searched your deck for two grass energy, and attached them to one of your bench Pokemon. Which bench Pokemon? Genesect. Genesect had the ability Red Signal. When you attached a Plasma Energy from your hand to Genesect, you got to gust one of your opponent's bench Pokemon into the active. That has always been one of the most powerful effects we've had in the game. And then for free energy, you did 100 to the active, 20 to one of your opponent's bench, which was a nice attack. And then, of course, we had cards like Chorus Machine that let you attach a Plasma Energy from your deck to a Team Plasma Pokemon, like Genesect. But the real great thing about this deck was G-Booster, a rather ridiculous tool card that let you do 200 damage. 200 damage! That is... Ridiculous. Like, back then, 200 damage was an absolutely preposterous amount of damage. And sure, you had to discard two energy to do so, but between Verizon Accelerating Energy and Chorus Machine, you would get the energy on it really wasn't the end of the world. And that was pretty much the entire deck. It was great. But I don't think it deserves to be on this list. Now, the two most harsh cuts I made, Seismitoad. And I'm sure a lot of you probably expected Seismitoad to be on this list if you followed the Pokemon trading card game closely. It had the attack for two energy, but we had double colorless, so it was really one energy attachment. 30 damage, and it stopped your opponent playing item cards. Shut down a lot of decks. And honestly, there were so many different builds of this throughout the years. Incidentally, I'm not counting the version with Lysander's trump card, because that got banned, so doesn't really count because they banned it before the US National Championships. So we didn't really ever get to dominate because it was so good it got banned. Because it was broken. More on that later. Hopefully. Depending on what order these videos are uploaded in, I'm assuming more on that later. And what we've essentially got here is just a card that shuts down tool cards, trainer cards, all kinds of trainer cards and item cards. But what it did then was it played Hypnotoxic Laser, Automatic Poison, so they take damage between turns, and a 50% chance of sleep. And then Verbank City Gym, so that Poison went from 10 damage between turns to 30 damage between turns. And there were many different builds of Seismitoad that were great throughout the years, but the one thing they had in common really was this item lock plus what we call laser bank combination. But it never actually won Worlds. It came very, 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 very close. We did see, I believe it was Maze Breckenmeyer, did go and get second place at the World Championships with a Seismitoad Crobat deck that was had a bunch of Pokemon like Crobat that dropped extra damage counters when you evolved into them. But shall we say the final of the World Championships that year um, did not go terribly well. And because we never had a Masters winning Worlds deck with Seismitoad, I don't think I can in good conscience put this on the list. I'm sorry. But the biggest cut for me was Luxchomp. I thought Luxchomp was going to be on this list, but the more I sat down and looked at it, and the more I analysed the formats in which these cards were good, etc., I, I couldn't do it. Now, what we've got is Luxray and Garchomp. Now, these were SP decks, but essentially, it was Luxray and Garchomp. They were the real, real big ones here. Luxray had the poker power Bright Look, when you evolved into Luxray, you got to drag a bench Pokemon active. Yes, you are seeing a theme. Two energy, 60 damage, plus 30 to one of your Pokemon was fine, but it wasn't amazing. But Garchomp C level X, when you evolved into it, you healed all damage from all of your Pokemon SP. 
And Pokemon SP, I should add, they were all basic, even though Luxray and Garchomp are stage 2s, they were basic Pokemon. Level X is you leveled up your existing basic Pokemon, you got more HP, but you could still use the attacks, etc. of the Pokemon underneath it. And for free energy, you did 80 damage to one of your opponent's Pokemon, just so long as you discarded 2 energy from Garchomp. And this was good until Double Colorless Energy was reprinted, and then it was amazing. Because we had to card Energy Gain, so you attach Energy Gain to Garchomp to reduce the attack cost by 1, and it was Double Colorless, discard it, 80 damage. Double Colorless, discard it, 80 damage. This would wreck your opponent's support Pokemon on the bench, and lead to very quick victories. And there were lots of different parts of this deck. You had things like Power Spray, which could turn off your opponent's Poker Powers, which was kind of awesome. You had things like Poker Turn that would let you pick up your Pokemon so that they couldn't actually get KO'd, so you could reuse abilities or Poker Powers, etc. We had Crobat G, which dropped extra damage when you benched it. That was pretty good. Yeah, that was a bit of a theme for Crobat throughout the years. But the fact of the matter is, when this deck was dominant, we also had Machamp, which gave it a good run for its money, and Gengar decks, and Gyarados decks. It wasn't the only great deck around. And although it did win the World Championships in 2010, that was Utah Komatsuda, it wasn't a dominating performance. It was, in fact, a top deck. He top decked Uxie, and that won him the game. Had he not done that, probably wouldn't have won Worlds, though it did win US Nationals as well. This was a very, very hard cut, but the fact of the matter is, when this deck was legal, there were so many other really good decks that I don't feel comfortable putting it on the list. So given that we've done 10 minutes of what didn't make the list, probably time to look at the three decks that absolutely did. And we're going to be going in, well, weirdly, reverse chronological order, but we'll also be going from least to most dominant. Darkrai Mewtwo. Darkrai Mewtwo was very much the poster child of the black and white era in the Pokemon trading card game. What we had here was two basic Pokemon that just dominated and hit super, super hard. You did get Dark Red X without Mewtwo and Mewtwo decks without Darkrai, but they were at their best when they were together. Darkrai had an ability giving each of your Pokemon with any Darkness Energy attached free retreat, which was kind of nuts. And an attack that for free energy did 90 to the active, 30 to one of your opponent's bench. And I point out when I'm right quite a lot, so I also like to try and point out when I'm wrong. When this card was revealed, I was podcasting regularly and I said, Oh, that'll see a bit of play for the ability, but the attack isn't good enough. Q, one of the most dominating Pokemon we have ever seen in the history of the game. Yeah, talk about a miss. You see, the thing with Darkrai was you would set up multiple KOs. And when you're taking multiple KOs in one turn, that made it harder for your opponent to disrupt you with cards like N that put you down to a new hand equal to the number of remaining prize cards you had. Because you were taking lots in one go. You could take out supporting Pokemon just with residual damage. It was nuts. And then you had Mewtwo. And we all knew how good Mewtwo was going to be. Nobody was surprised by Mewtwo. The second we saw Mewtwo, we all assumed it was going to be a dominant card. And honestly, the only really good counter for Mewtwo we ever found was Mewtwo. Because for two colorless energy, it did 20 damage for each energy attached to both active Pokemon. So essentially what you did was you just piled energy onto Mewtwo and you smashed. But Mewtwo with a double colorless would be countered by Mewtwo and either free energy or two energy with a plus power. And this deck got stupid. At the World Championships in 2012, seven of the top eight decks were Darkrai variants, most of them Mewtwo. And to be fair, and obviously it won Worlds, but even in 2013, Jason Klazinski won his third World Championships with a Darkrai solo deck with no Mewtwo. And there were plenty of other cards that really did come in with this deck. Dark Patch let you accelerate dark energy from your discard to bench dark Pokemon i.e. Darkrai. Back then, we had Pokemon Catcher to let you drag any Pokemon into the active as an item card. And this card still exists today. It's still legal today. Well, as I record this in September 2020. But it now needs a coin flip because that was broken. 
Except it wasn't quite as broken as it sounds. It was more so because we had Junk Arm at the time that let you discard two cards from your hand and grab a trainer card back from your discard. So essentially everyone had eight Pokemon Catcher in their deck and any time you wanted to gust a Pokemon into the active, you could always do so. It wasn't difficult. We had Eevee Alight, which reduced damage done to your basic Pokemon. And these were basics. We had Terrakion. Now, Terrakion for two energy, if you had a Pokemon KO the previous turn, would get a one-hit KO on Darkrai. So, kind of everyone played Terrakion to counter Darkrai. So, Darkrai played it to counter other Darkrai. Shaman was amazing at the time, because it moved your energy around your field as you like. Or, a lot of the time piled all your energy onto one Mewtwo, because if your opponent didn't have a Mewtwo counter ready, you could just pile energy on Mewtwo and sweep for the game, which is a bit dumb. Plus power was always fun for a bit of extra damage, and not so much in Darkrai Mewtwo decks, but definitely in straight Darkrai decks, Sableye and its Junk Hunt attack, getting two item cards from your discard pile into your hand, was an absolute must. If you want to criticise this deck, you could say that Mewtwo decks were great and Darkrai decks were great. And both of those statements are true, incidentally. But Darkrai Mewtwo in 2012 really was a case of, you're probably playing it or a direct counter, or you're not winning Worlds. And when we get down to the top 8 of Worlds, and 7 of the 8 are Darkrai decks, most of them being Darkrai Mewtwo, that should tell you everything you need to know. But I don't think that deck was as dominant as Gardevoir Gallade. Now, I've been doing my history series on my YouTube channel over the past, what, few months at this stage. And this is about the era we've got to. And I've been talking about this in my history videos. But it's hard for me to state quite how dominant Gardevoir Gallade was back around about 2008. It was ridiculous, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely ridiculous. You see, we had Gardevoir with a poker power that let you use a supporter card in your opponent's discard pile. So yeah, you're getting an extra, and supporters are limited to once during your turn. So now you're getting two supporter cards every turn, which seems a little bit dumb, unfair, good. But the best thing about it was free energy, psychic lock, 60 damage, and you turned off your opponent's poker powers. Your opponent didn't have any poker powers. That is harsh, ladies and gentlemen. That is absolutely harsh. It's just ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. It was an attack that just won multiple... And I want to say multiple tournaments. That doesn't really do it justice. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was over-the-top brokenly good. But again, even that doesn't really show you quite how good this was. Then, of course, you had Gallade. Now, you'll notice Gallade is a fighting type. They actually evolved from the same stage one Pokemon, which made it a bit easier. So now you're hitting Psychic Weakness or Fighting Weakness. But you've got an attack that either puts damage counters on the defending Pokemon until it's 50 HP away from being KO'd, and then makes your opponent switch. Or for free energy, you do 60 damage. But you get to flip as many of your six prize cards face up as you like. Doing 20 more for each prize card you chose, which would potentially do up to 180 damage. But when you consider these are stage 2 Pokemon with 110 and 130 HP, you should hopefully be able to see quite how much 180 damage was. But that wasn't even everything! Because we had Gardevoir level X. It had the Poker Power Teleportation, which basically let it switch in and out of the active spot as often as you liked either from the bench to the active, or the active to the bench. And for two energy, just KO'd the Pokemon with the lowest amount of HP remaining that wasn't Gardevoir. Bearing in mind, your Gallade could put one of your opponent's Pokemon down to 50 HP remaining, which would often make it the lowest HP remaining Pokemon on the field. Gardevoir level X says hello. And those three Pokemon together were just absolutely nuts. We had cards like Scramble Energy at the time, where if you were behind on prizes, it was free energy of any type that you like. So it could pay these attacks in one go, which was a little bit over the top. And then we had cards like Claydol and Uxie just giving ridiculous consistency. In 2008, Jason Kaczynski won his second World Championships with Gardevoir Gallade. 
and Gino Lombardi won US Nationals with this deck as well. It was three of the top four at US Nationals and it won the World Championships even though everyone was gunning for it that wasn't playing it. Still ended up winning Worlds. And the most ridiculous thing... In 2010, I told you that Lux Chomp won the World Championships, but it was kind of a top deck that got it there, and it could very, very easily have lost Worlds. You know what deck it beat in the final? This! Two years after this won Worlds, it came that close to winning Worlds again. Yeah. There is a strong argument it should have won Worlds two out of three years, with a gap in between, so basically the entire time it was... It's ridiculous, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely ridiculous. And yet that is not the most dominant Pokemon deck we ever saw. That goes to Haymaker. Now, proper obsessive Pokemon fans, not unlike myself, may argue that Haymaker is overblown. And there's an argument that it is. Now... You see, this was the deck in the base set era. When the first set of Pokemon cards came out, this was it. This was the dominant deck. And honestly, it was dominant to the point where everybody played it or lost to it. And it wasn't really a very good counter. Now, obsessive nerds like myself have since gone back and actually found better decks. And if you get obsessive nerdy Pokemon fans like myself and chuck them into the base set era now... Maybe Haymaker isn't as dominant as it was back then. But that's not the question we're asking in this video now. In this video, we are asking about the most dominant decks ever, i.e. when they were legal. And when this was legal, there was nothing close. And I mean nothing close. And it was all built around Electabuzz and Hitmonchan. And you see... In the Pokemon video games, you would have your basic Pokemon that evolved into Stage 2s, and your Stage 2s were good. And everybody, when they got their cards, they wanted to play Blastoise, and Charizard, and Venusaur. But they weren't the great cards. Hitmonchan and Electabuzz, they were the great cards. You see, Hitmonchan, single energy, 20 damage. Electabuzz, single energy, 10 damage. Paralysis on a coin flip. Or 2 energy, 30 damage. 40 if you flipped heads. Tend to yourself if you flip tails. And the thing was, that although these cards looked fine, but they did not look as impressive as something like a Blastoise at first glance, it was all the other cards we had around at the time that made these so ridiculous. We had Gust of Wind, an item card that let you just drag a Pokemon into the active, very much like the original print of Pokemon Catcher i.e. they're the same card. And again, all these decks I'm talking to you about gusting because you get to basically beat your opponent before they're set up if you're a better deck. We had plus power, so yeah, fine. You didn't do that much damage, but actually you did more because of plus power. And remember the HPs were a lot lower back then. And we had cards like energy removal and super energy removal that would just take your opponent's energy away. And essentially, yes, fine, these Pokemon look like they're not doing that much damage, but when you're constantly using Gust of Wind to KO weaker Pokemon, and you're using Energy Removal and Super Energy Removal to make sure your opponent never has any energy on the field, yeah, this dominated. Because you see, those decks like Blastoise, they looked like a lot of fun. Couldn't set up. Those Squirtles would go down before they ever got a chance to evolve the vast majority of the time. And if you couldn't evolve and you couldn't keep energy on the field, you couldn't beat these basic Pokemon. And yes... If we go back to the base set now, there are other decks we have since devised that can take care of this deck. But back when the first lot of Pokemon cards came out, this was it, ladies and gentlemen. This was it. So there we go, the most dominant Pokemon decks we've ever had. Some really, really good dominant decks that didn't quite make the cut. And then the three that did. And I have talked to a lot of people figuring out this video. I have done a donkulous amount of research and I've come to the conclusion that these are the three most dominant decks we've ever had. But what fun would it be if we couldn't have an argument? So make sure you chuck a comment down and tell me what you think whether any of these decks didn't deserve it although you're going to need a strong argument to knock any off the list or whether you thought there were some other decks that deserved to go on instead. Hopefully I have shared my reasoning well enough. 
Shout out to the lovely folks at Tabletop Gaming, the only magazine I've subscribed to. And like I said in the previous video, yes, I am fully aware that they've worked with me with this and a podcast and I wrote a column for them and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I've been subscribed since long before I did anything with them. Seriously, quite a long time before. So that, that doesn't work. It's a great magazine. Genuinely, I'm a huge fan. And yeah, I literally could not recommend it highly enough. They didn't ask me to give a plug, but... I read it every month and look forward to it arriving and absolutely love it. Seems weird that I'd make this video and not tell you how much I love it, given that it's true. So shout out Tabletop Gaming, shout out to you guys, and of course, the most important thing as always, look after yourselves till next time, would ya? Thank you very much for watching. My name's Ross, and you've been watching PTCG Radio. Bye!